molecular cell biology, and I'm very pleased to do that. Uh, this talk is based on a, an opinion piece that Bela Novak and I wrote and published in the Trends of Cell Biology a couple years ago. So there are no, there's no new science in this talk, but I hope it'll be uh, useful in providing a, a paradigm or a perspective for how to use uh, sophisticated mathematical modeling in molecular cell biology. So um, let's uh, start. Let's start by considering a classic case of, of cell biology, which is regulation of the cell division cycle in eukaryotic cells. So as you know, the cell cycle is the process by which a cell replicates its DNA and then divides the replicated chromosomes between two uh, daughter cells. And it's the foundation for all of biological growth and reproduction. Uh, and for a long time, it's been a challenge to molecular cell biologists to understand or to work out the details of the molecular mechanism that controls progression through the cell cycle and, and the events of DNA synthesis and mitosis. In the 1980s and 90s, it was worked out that the progression through the eukaryotic cell cycle is controlled by a family of cyclin-dependent protein kinases. There are three important ones, cyclin E, cyclin A, and cyclin B. So cyclin E and cyclin A-dependent kinases drive the cell into DNA synthesis. And then after DNA synthesis is complete, uh, cyclin B-dependent kinase drives the cell into mitosis, and then all of these cyclins need to be destroyed at the end of the cell cycle in order for the cell to exit mitosis and, um, and divide and, and, and go into G1 again. Uh, so the, the, the details of the network were worked out over uh, several decades, and um, this diagram that I show you here is basically, a, it's a basic uh, understanding of the molecular interactions that control the activities of these cyclin-dependent kinases, control the synthesis and degradation of the cyclins, and control the activity of the cyclins by, say, inhibitory phosphorylations or binding to uh, stoichiometric inhibitors. And once some details of the mechanism were worked out, um, a crucial question became, well, this is a hypothetical mechanism. Does it really, can it really be used as a basis for understanding uh, the facts and the behavior of uh, the cell cycle progression in a variety of eukaryotic organisms from, from yeasts and algae to plants to um, to fruit flies and frogs and human cells. And the problem with just looking at this mechanism and trying to understand how cells proceed through the cell cycle is that the, the mechanism is very complicated and it's full of um, positive and negative feedback signals that are represented by all the dashed arrows on the diagram. So a complex um, system like this is very hard to appreciate to understand how it's going to behave just from verbal reasoning alone. And I call this the curse of complexity. It, it, it prevents us from perhaps understanding the details of any aspect of cell physiology on the basis of the increasingly complexity of, the, of our understanding of the underlying control mechanisms. Well, a biophysicist might say, okay, we can solve this problem because we can use standard principles of biochemical kinetics to convert a reaction diagram like this into a set of nonlinear ordinary differential equations, and then just put these equations on the computer and let the computer work out, um, simulate the behavior of the network under a variety of physiologically relevant conditions. The problem with this brute force kinetic approach is before you can do any simulations of the differential equations, you have to specify the numerical values of all the kinetic parameters that enter into the model. And for a model of any complexity, there are gonna be dozens or maybe hundreds of kinetic parameters that have to be estimated. 
And it's just not possible to estimate these parameters from the available data because of the size of the parameter space and uh, the paucity, really, of, uh, of kinetic data. And I call this the curse of parameter space. And it prevents us from pursuing this brute force simulation approach. What Bela Novak and I have been doing over the last several decades is to approach the problem from a different direction, uh, using concepts from dynamical systems theory. The basic idea of dynamical systems theory is that we shouldn't think of a set of ordinary differential equations as a challenge for numerical simulations, but rather the differential equations are trying to um, are trying to suggest to us a vector field in the state space of the dynamical system. And in order to draw these vector fields, I'm going to limit to just two differential equations for the variables u and v. But I want you to remember that everything I say can be carried over to a dozen differential equations or a hundred differential equations. The point is that differential equations define, uh, they assign a vector at every point in the state space, they assign a vector which tells you which direction the system wants to move in. And if we can visualize this vector field, then essentially we can integrate the differential equations by i just by following the vectors. The vectors will tell us where we have to go. And in this simple case, we see that the, the vector field defines two unstable steady states represented by the open circles, two stable steady states represented by the black. I think I missed your call. Question? And uh, okay, thank you. steady state in the middle represented by the X. The vector field is somewhat analogous to a topographic map of a landscape, in which case the unstable steady states correspond to the mountain peaks on the topography. And the stable steady states correspond to, say, two lakes in the valleys on either side of the ridge. And you know from walking on these kinds of landscapes that the easiest path to get from one lake to the other is to go over the ridge through the saddle point between the two peaks, which is the X, okay? So on, on a topographic map, that point is called a saddle point. And we use that terminology in the vector field, the X in the middle is a saddle point, the two unstable nodes are the mountain peaks, and the two stable nodes are the lakes. Now, the idea of dynamical systems theory is that the solutions of differential equations depend upon any number of parameters on the right-hand sides of the differential equations. And we want to understand how the vector field changes as we change any one or more of these parameters. So again, let's take a simple possibility. I, I identify a parameter P, and uh, for P equal one, we have the vector field, that I just described. As P increases, let's suppose that the saddle and the node, the saddle point and the node, come closer and closer together as P increases until eventually at a value P equal three, the saddle and the node coalesce. And as soon as we go past the coalescence point, here's the coalescence point, now the saddle and the node annihilate each other. There's no longer any steady state in this region. And now uh, the vector field says that any initial condition will eventually go to the stable steady state in the upper left-hand corner. So the point is that as we change the parameter, there's an abrupt transition between regions for P less than three, where there are two stable steady states, to a region with P greater than three, where there's only one stable steady state. And that's called a bifurcation point, where the qualitative features of the solutions of the differential equations change. And in this case, it's called a saddle node bifurcation point. Now, the behavior 
of a dynamical system near a bifurcation point is usually described in terms of a bifurcation diagram. In a bifurcation diagram, we are plotting the steady state value of a variable of the system against the fixed value of a parameter. And we're going to let the parameter change and see how the steady state values change. So we start at a value of P where there are two stable nodes separated by a saddle point and increase the parameter P. As P increases, the saddle point and the lower stable node come together and annihilate each other and pass the saddle node bifurcation. There's only one stable steady state, the upper stable steady state. So as the parameter P increases, the system makes an abrupt transition to the upper steady state. Once it's on the upper steady state, if we reduce the parameter P back to its original value, we stay on the upper steady state. So we would say that this transition is irreversible. You increase P and you make the transition, and then as you decrease P back to its original value, uh, you don't go back to where you were before. You're now in the, on the upper steady state. Now let's ask what happens if P decreases. Uh, then it can happen that the upper steady state coalesces with the locus of saddle points at a second saddle node bifurcation, and the upper steady state disappears. In that case, if we were to decrease P further, the system would be able to switch back from the upper stable steady state back to the lower steady state. And between the two saddle node bifurcations, we have a region of bistability. And this bistability makes this a resettable switch, which I'll call a toggle switch. You flip, you push the parameter up and you flip the toggle switch from the off state, the lower steady state to the on state. You push the parameter back in the other direction and you flip the toggle switch back to the off state. So that's one arrangement of very common arrangement of saddle node bifurcations. But it's also possible that the, um, that the switch doesn't flip off until the parameter value achieves negative values. And if this parameter is a kinetic rate constant, that's impossible. So in this case, we have a one-way switch where if we start on the lower state, steady state and increase the parameter, uh, we'll jump to the upper steady state, we'll flip the switch on, but then when we decrease the parameter, even down to zero, the system will stay on the upper steady state. So this switch is not resettable. It's a one-way switch analogous to a simple fuse in your electrical system. Now, there don't have to be bifurcations. It could be that you, as you increase the parameter, there's just a smooth change from maybe lower steady states to higher steady states. It could be quite abrupt. It could be very sigmoidal in shape. But in this case, the transition is completely reversible. You move up when you go in one direction and you move back down again on the same path in the other direction. I tend to call that a buzzer as distinct from a toggle switch or a fuse. But these are maybe three different ways that cells can try to make a decision to move from one kind of a stable steady state to another kind of steady state. Okay. Now, I wanna give an example of uh, these ideas. And it's a very nice example, I think that was pursued by Jinwa and his colleagues, uh, I guess, first at Virginia Tech and then at University of Pittsburgh. It's the TGF beta induced uh, epithelial to mesenchymal transition. And this transition from epithelial cells to mesenchymal cells uh, occurs through an intermediate state called partial EMT. And it's induced by uh, the hormone TGF beta. So if you start with zero TGF beta cells in the epithelial state, as you increase the external signal, first the cells make the intermediate transition to the partial EMT, 
And then at very high concentrations of TGF beta, they complete the transition to the mesenchymal state. Now, an interesting question is what happens if we give the cells enough TGF beta to go to the partial EMT state and then reduce TGF beta? Uh, we find that this first switch is a resettable toggle switch because the partial EMT cells will go back to the epithelial state. But once the cells have reached the mesenchymal state, you can reduce TGF beta to zero and the cells will stay in the mesenchymal phenotype. So we see in this particular case, the examples of both kinds of um, bistable switches. So um, Jingma and his team went on to look at the underlying regular regulatory system, which is based on these transcription factors, SNAIL-1 and ZEB-1, and their inhibitory microRNAs. They built a mathematical model and calculated the bifurcation diagram for uh, this switch as a function of TGF beta and found indeed that the first transition is a resettable toggle switch and the second transition is this one-way fuse because to get back, you'd have to go to negative concentrations of TGF beta. Okay. Uh, I want to present a second example, an interesting example of some dynamics within cells. This is a classic example of glycolytic oscillations in yeast cell extracts, which was studied in the 1950s and 1960s by Britton Chance and his colleagues at the University of Pennsylvania and um, Benno Hess and his colleagues in Dortmund in, um, in Germany. And what they observed was you could make a a yeast cell extract, put it in a cuvette and introduce a glucose flux through the cuvette and monitor NADH fluorescence. And the observation was that at certain um, glucose injection rates, NADH would exhibit these spontaneous sinusoidal oscillations with a period of about five or six minutes. These oscillations were studied in great detail, and people found out that when the glucose injection rate is small, there's a stable steady state with high NADH. When the glucose injection rate is large, there's a stable steady state with low NADH. And it's only for these intermediate glucose injection rates that you see the oscillations. And the oscillations are characterized by the fact that when they first appear, their small amplitude, and they have a period of about eight and a half minutes. As the glucose injection rate increases, the amplitude of the oscillations increases and then decreases back to zero, uh, and the oscillations die with a period of about three and a half minutes. So uh, this is a, an example of what might call a signal response curve for an oscillatory system. It shows you the values of the parameters where you see the oscillation. In 1972, Goldbeater and Lefevre introduced a, uh, a little mathematical model of the glycolytic oscillations based on the regulatory properties of the enzyme phosphofructokinase, which is activated by its product, ADP, and inhibited by its substrate, ATP. And the complicated dynamics of this enzyme, they reduce to a pair of nonlinear ordinary differential equations for U and V, and the glucose injection rate is the parameter sigma. They solve these differential equations for a certain value of sigma, say sigma equal two, and they find in the phase space, the state space, a closed orbit, which is called a limit cycle oscillation, and it represents uh, the spontaneous sustained oscillations in NADH fluorescence. Furthermore, they calculated the bifurcation diagram for this model plotting um, the dynamical variable V as a function of the parameter sigma 
and they found that low glucose injection rates, there's a stable steady state with low concentration of V, the steady state loses stability, and that's where they observe the oscillations. And then at high injection rates, the steady state regains stability and the oscillations are lost. So the amplitude of the oscillations first increases and then decreases. The period of the oscillation just kind of steadily decreases from a high of about eight and a half minutes to three and a half minutes. And the, oh, these, these are bifurcation points where the qualitative nature of the solutions of the differential equations change, and they're called up bifurcation points. And uh, the output of the model in terms of period and amplitude as a function of glucose injection rate agrees very nicely with the experimental observations. Uh, I just wanted to show you a picture of what a hop bifurcation looks like as you change parameter values. So what happens when you go from a small value of a parameter? First, you have a stable node, and then the stable node becomes a stable focus where you get damped oscillations coming into the stable focus. Then the steady state loses stability at P equal three, and for values of P larger than three, the steady state is an unstable focus. And now trajectories wind away from the unstable focus onto the stable limit cycle. So this is the characteristic feature of a uh, hop bifurcation. And the hop bifurcation point is the place where the stable focus loses stability and becomes an unstable focus. And the stable limit cycles appear around the unstable focus. Okay, so let me summarize what I've been saying so far with this diagram that I call the dynamical paradigm for molecular systems. Suppose we're interested in some aspect of cell physiology like the epithelial to mesenchymal transition. And we would like to understand the underlying molecular control mechanism. We read a lot of papers about molecular genetics and biochemistry and cell biology, and we come up with a proposed, a hypothetical molecular mechanism that we think could explain the transition. So for instance, this little network between the transcription factors. And the question is, is the hypothetical molecular mechanism sufficient to explain the observed properties of the epithelial to mesenchymal transition? And what I've been trying to say is, you can't just use your biochemical intuition to make a connection between the mechanism and the physiology because of the complexity of these underlying mechanisms and the complexity of the observed physiology. Well, we would like then say to convert the molecular mechanism into a set of kinetic equations and solve the kinetic equations to see what they predict about the observed behavior, but we're blocked from doing this by the curse of parameter space any reasonable model with a dozen or more unknown parameters is going to be very difficult to simulate. The dynamical paradigm is to drop those approaches and think of the system as a dynamical system, as a state, multi-dimensional state space carrying a vector field, and to characterize the transitions in those vector fields by bifurcation diagrams. And the one I want to emphasize is about a bifurcation diagram is a plot of an output of a system, a variable of the system, against an input, some parameter that's under experimental control. So a bifurcation diagram is just in the standard format of a signal response curve. The output, say, the um, the differentiated state of the cells as a function of the exogenous signal of the TGF beta. So in order to connect the physiology to the underlying molecular biology, 
we want to make a connection between observed signal response curves and the potential bifurcation diagram that could explain the behavior. Once we have and the bifurcation diagram, once we see what it has to look like, it gives us information about what the underlying molecular mechanism has to be, what kind of feedbacks have to be in the molecular mechanism in order to produce a bifurcation diagram like that. And it also gives us information about where we have to be in parameter space to get the right bifurcations to explain uh, the physiology of the cells. And the same thing is true of situations like lipidic oscillations or circadian rhythms, where we're trying to understand um, oscillatory behavior of cells. We need, to, we need to characterize the signal response curve, how the oscillations arise and are lost as a parameter changes and connect that to the bifurcation diagram. Uh, derived from the underlying molecular mechanism. So uh, that's what we uh, call the dynamical paradigm. And Bela and I have used this paradigm over the last 30 years uh, to investigate a number of, um, of different problems in, in cell physiology. Maybe I should just pause here for a minute to see if there are any questions uh, of clarification, something that's not particularly clear. Something in the chat? No? Yes. Hello, thank you for the um, presentation. So I was wondering, how do you combine variability in expression levels of individual proteins in this kind of framework, as we know that in gene regulation, there's a lot of stochasticity in the expression level. And the question is, how good does it mean actually describes your system? And then also the second question is, how do you include temp temporal dynamics? Because cell cycle is like a highly temporal dynamic system. And I was wondering, when you look at the steady states, how you can incorporate that. Thank you. Yeah, okay. Uh, I want to hold those questions to the end. I, I knew I would get the question about stochasticity, and, and I will address that at the end, okay? Thank you. Okay. Yeah, uh, yeah, Alexandra? Hello, thank you. Uh, so I have a basic question. But I somehow maybe didn't understand exactly uh, why construction of these bifurcation diagrams um, does not uh, suffer from this dimensionality curse that we have a lot of parameters. Because I can mm -hmm. imagine that for very different parameters in this scheme, the diagrams will also be different. Yeah, that's a good question. And I think the answer is, once we see what the signal response curve is, given by the physiology. As a dynamical system theorist, we, we know what the underlying bifurcation diagram is gonna to have to look like to explain that physiology. Then when we understand the dynamical system, we go back to the molecular mechanism and ask ourselves, are there feedback and feed forward signals in the proposed molecular mechanism that could possibly give us the bifurcation diagram that we need, okay? If they're not there, <laughs> then there's something wrong with the mechanism. If they are there, we know exactly where to look. And now there's a limited number of parameters that control that part of the diagram that's generating, say, the bistability if it's a switch. And we can start to estimate what those parameters need to be in order to give us the bifurcation diagram that's going to fit the signal response curve. And we have to, a complicated mechanism, we have to break apart into many smaller pieces. Each piece described by a certain signal response curve worked out by the experimentalist. And experimentalists are very good at this, at isolating a particular part of the mechanism and exploring it parametrically with some external control. And so you can begin to put the pieces of the puzzle together like that. 
rather than trying to solve the whole thing at once, which is impossible. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Good question. So if this par paradigm is correct, then how many different types of bifurcation diagrams and signal response curves can we expect to see? First of all, there are monotonic signal response curves that don't show any bifurcations. The response to the signal may be a simple linear response, or it may saturate, or perhaps it's an abrupt sigmoidal response, but there are no bifurcations that occur. So far, we've only seen these two types of bifurcations, saddle node bifurcations that could easily underlie cellular decision-making and Hopf bifurcations, which are a good place to look to understand spontaneous oscillations in cells and cellular plane keeping. But now I wanna talk about some other types of bifurcations that we need to be aware of because we need to be able to spot them in the signal response curve. So first of all, let me point out that hop bifurcations come in two flavors, supercritical hop bifurcations, which I've already described, and subcritical hop bifurcations, where the small amplitude limit cycles are unstable. And the subcritical hop bifurcation is always associated with a cyclic fold bifurcation where the unstable limit cycles are converted into stable limit cycles. And there's a big difference between these two. In the case of a supercritical hop bifurcation, as we increase the parameter, the oscillations are born with small amplitude and a finite period. And as you move away from the bifurcation point, the amplitude of the oscillation increases. On the other hand, for a subcritical hop bifurcation, when you first see the oscillations, they're already full grown, large amplitude oscillations. So they have very different signatures. A, a completely different way to generate an oscillation is by a homoclinic bifurcation, which is a little more complicated. Here we start off at P equal one with an unstable node and a stable node and the saddle point and a heteroclinic orbit that connects the saddle point, loops around the unstable node and comes into the stable node from the other side. Now, as we change the parameter and push the uh, saddle, I'm sorry, push the saddle and the node together, we get what's called a homoclinic orbit because now this is a single um, saddle node point and there's a trajectory that comes out one side, loops around and comes back into the same steady state from the other side. That's called a homoclinic orbit. And as soon as we push past the homoclinic, the saddle and the node disappears and the homoclinic orbit becomes a stable limit cycle. The limit cycle has large amplitude and it has long period because the motion of the system in this region is very, very slow because that's where the steady states used to be. And a bifurcation diagram for a homoclinic bifurcation to oscillations is a rather complicated picture that combines uh, all the other bifurcations that we've talked about so far. But this is a very common um, route to um, periodic solutions in nonlinear differential equations. So essentially we have three basic routes to the onset of oscillations. Supercritical hop bifurcation is small amplitude and finite frequency. Subcritical hop bifurcation is large amplitude and finite frequency. Homoclinic bifurcation is large amplitude and infinitesimal frequency. The frequency goes to zero, the period goes to infinity. So you have to be aware of these different routes to oscillations. So again, if this dynamical perspective is correct, then all signal response curves must be composed of the monotone responses, linear, saturating, and sigmoidal, and the bifurcating responses, so far, saddle node, hop bifurcations, homoclinic bifurcations. And the, again, the question arises, how many qualitatively different types of bifurcations of vector fields are possible. 
Are there hundreds of different bifurcations, in which case we would be in trouble, or are there only a few? And the answer is there's just a handful of, of robust bifurcations of vector fields for nonlinear dynamical systems. And a very excellent textbook to learn about these bifurcations is the one by Yuri Kuznetsov, Elements of Applied Bifurcation Theory. And I highly recommend it. Kuznetsov does a very good job of giving you precise, accurate mathematical description of the possible bifurcations, but also giving you an intuition into why the bifurcations work the way they do. It's, a, it's an excellent source. Okay, so in the minutes remaining, I want to discuss some future directions. Can we apply this dynamical paradigm to molecular cell biology to the kinds of experimental data and experimental studies that are common nowadays? And I'm particularly referring to um, data-rich um, investigations of cell physiology. And I'm gonna talk about three examples, single cell multiplex protein imaging, single cell RNA sequence data, and high throughput mutant analysis. So let's start with single cell multiplex protein imaging based on 4I technology. 4I stands for iterative indirect immunofluorescent imaging. And the example I'm using is this lovely paper by Stallard et al. on human RPE cells, retinal pigmented epithelial cells, okay? And the way you do this is you take an asynchronous population of growing and dividing RPE cells, and they're fixed on a slide and stained uh, with a fluorescent immunoglobulins against different proteins. And you can stain for one protein, then you can wash off the stain and stain for a different protein and wash it off and stain for a third protein. And in this particular experiment, they stained, they imaged 48 different core cell cycle proteins. So it's a huge amount of data. Uh, at first, there's a challenge because this is an asynchronous population of cells that are fixed, so they're not changing in time, but we would like to know what the temporal um, development of the system is. And you can do this by a trick called pseudo-time ordering because the cells are also stained for indicators of where the cell is in the cell cycle. So every cell can be identified by its location in the cell cycle, and then um, the levels of the imaged proteins can be associated with that level in the cell cycle. And after a lot of data processing, you can begin to express the data in a figure like this. So this must be some kind of principal component analysis of the data, and you see very clearly that the cells are proceeding around the standard cell cycle, G1 into S, into G2, into mitosis, and then dividing and coming back to uh, G1. What's also evident from the data is that there are two decision points in this cell cycle where cells can exit the cell cycle. If cells can exit the cell cycle in G1, they go into a phase called G0, which is a kind of resting phase. And that transition into G0 is reversible because cells in G0 can re-enter uh, the cell cycle uh, by uh, activating a cycling called cyclin D1. In the G2 phase of the cell cycle, there's also a second exit point, but this exit point drives the cells into a senescent phase um, where they're, they're locked in G2 and they can not return to the cell cycle and eventually they die. The paper refers to these two exit points as bifurcation points. I think in the informal sense that the two pairs diverge, so it's a bifurcating two 
paths diverged in a yellow wood kind of a situation. But I'm sure that these exit points are controlled by a decision process that's controlled by an underlying um, um, bistable switch. And the exit point in, in G1 has to be a reversible toggle switch, whereas the exit point in G2 is probably a one-way switch like a, a fuse, but that has to be worked out. And I might also say that there's a huge amount of data here, wonderful data that's just begging to be um, analyzed by an accurate quantitative model of the dynamics of all of these 48 different cell cycle effectors. Now we know how their levels are changing as the cells progress through the cell cycle and as they exit the cell cycle. And um, th there is yet to be uh, a good mathematical model of this data. It's quite new, right? Only been around for a couple months. Okay. My second example is single cell RNA seq data. And again, this comes from uh, collaborators of uh, Jinhua. Uh, and they were studying human hematopoietic stem cells, the differentiation of human hematopoietic stem cells. And they induced the differentiation with a hormone, I don't know which, and collected cells at various time points along the differentiation pathway and uh, did RNA-seq data on the cells. And from the data, after a lot of data processing, they come up with a vector field that's reconstructed from the data. And it shows more or less how the stem cells diverge from each other to different um, types of blood cells, megakaryocytes, erythrocytes, what are these basophils, monocytes, and neutrophils, okay? And then the other part of the paper is the theoretical analysis based on a, a model uh, which shows you what the vector field of the dynamical model looks like. And the starting point is, say, an unstable state when you add the um, inducer. And the stem cells can diverge to five different alternative uh, stable steady states in, in very nice agreement with the uh, um, vector field reconstructed from the data. So I think this is also a very nice example of how you can use these notions from dynamical systems theory, to understand um, very complex and detailed um, experimental data. My final example is high throughput uh, mutant analysis in budding yeast cells. Um, in this example, Galagos et al, were trying to make crosses of cell cycle genes. They were looking at 36 different cell cycle genes, which had the property that you can put a mutation into any one of these genes and it's not fatal to the yeast cells, okay? So these are called non-essential genes. The mutant is a viable mutant. But then the question is, when I cross two viable mutants to, bank, to obtain a double mutant, is the double mutant viable or is the double mutant inviable? If the double mutant is inviable, that's called synthetic lethality. And that tells you that those two gene products are interacting with each other and controlling the cell cycle. And if you knock out both of them, you kill the cell. So the question is, how can we characterize the synthetic lethality among these genes? So you take 36 mutant strains, you make 630 crosses between all of those strains, and you have to ask whether the cross gives you a viable cells or inviable cells. And there's a lot of experimental uncertainty in these sorts of experiments. You don't always get the same result. So all of these crosses were repeated eight times in the two different mating types of the yeast cells. So there were over five, with all of the controls, there were something like 6,000 or more crosses that were generated by a robot. Of course, this is done by a robot to make the crosses. 
And the results of all these crosses are illustrated in these kinds of array, arrays where each little square is a particular cross of two of these cell cycle genes. And the blue squares are viable crosses and the white squares are the inviable crosses. And you want to check over the eight different um, plates here that the inviable crosses, the synthetic lethality is reproducible and not just an accident of how that particular cross was done. So again, lots of data generates some reliability on classifying whether you have synthetic lethality or not. And then in this paper, there was an underlying mathematical model of the budding yeast cell cycle, which was used to predict viability or inviability of the crosses. And the data was used to help understand the model and vice versa. So these are just three different examples of the kinds of um, high throughput data that can benefit from this sort of uh, dynamical approach, at least in my opinion. So I'll stop there, uh, give you the reference for the opinion piece in trends in cell biology and take questions. And maybe we'll start with the question about stochasticity. Okay, Jinwa. Yeah, thanks, John. Very nice uh, uh, talk. So now, um, yeah, you may start with that question. Stochasticity. This definitely people ask this. Yeah, because I, I think it's probably on a lot of people's minds. Yeah. And, um, what I say is, you're absolutely right. Um, a yeast cell, even a mammalian cell, they're very small cells. We know in yeast cells that on average, there's only five or 10 copies of uh, messenger RNA from any particular gene. There's only a handful of messenger RNA molecules. The messenger RNAs are translated into proteins. And you know, for, for rare proteins, there might only be a couple hundred copies of the proteins. Even for abundant proteins, there's only a couple thousand copies of abundant proteins. So, these small cells are very limited in terms of numbers of molecules, and so they have to be affected by stochastic fluctuations. And you say, well, it's ridiculous to describe a control system like that under those conditions in terms of deterministic nonlinear ordinary differential equations. It seems to be the wrong context. But I would argue well, that- Well, I, I don't think it's ridiculous. I'm just- I'm just asking. <laughs> Some people do. Some no, I, I mean, I think there's a nice way to approach this, I think so. Yeah, I think you have to approach it this way because the stochastic system is an order of magnitude more difficult to understand than the deterministic system. And it seems sensible to me to first approach the problem from a deterministic point of view and get a deterministic, and what we're trying to understand is the molecular mechanism, right? And let's first try to understand the molecular mechanism as if it were a deterministic process. And I tried to argue that that's very productive because these bifurcation diagrams of the deterministic system can be related directly to the kind of signal response curves that the experimentalist delivers. Once we have some confidence that the deterministic system is capable of explaining the basic features of the cell physiology, then for sure we have to convert the deterministic system into a stochastic system. And biophysicists know how to do this. We know how to go from the deterministic description of a chemical reaction network to a stochastic, an accurate stochastic description. And then we can investigate by stochastic simulations what the effects of stochasticity are going to be on the behavior of the system. But I think it would be impossible to go directly from the experiments to a stochastic model of an underlying control uh, system and get in there because I think the curse of parameter space and the curse of complexity is 
is an order of magnitude greater than approaching it from a deterministic point of view. So that's my answer, but Gregor, maybe you have something to add? Um, yeah, thank you. I think that, yeah, I think it's a good start. I mean, we have some, I mean, we, we work on much simpler systems, the gene regulation and the yeast system, and we looked at RNA fish expression over time, and we got really good predictive models. I mean, we also do signaling and we can fit models, simple models actually quite well, but when we make predictions for different conditions, then the models usually we break down really quickly, even if we have a lot of data. And for the single cell RNA fish data sets, we were able to actually predict very well. And then we asked, why is this the case? And we compared for the same model and the same data means, mean approaches, mean invariances. And what we found is that even so we can fit all the data, mean data very well, predictions were very really bad. They were off by three, four orders of magnitude for the predictions. Mm -hmm. and the reason was that in the systems, when you have very stochastic expression, a lot of off cells, and then some cells that have some expression, they have very long tails. And the central limit theorem of statistics wasn't really satisfied to apply these moment approaches. And this was our explanation why we couldn't really um, predict very well our data when we use mm -hmm. these moment approaches. And so basically what we did is from the single cell data, basically resample how of, how many cells would we would, would we need to measure in order to describe the mean accurately, and it was at the order of ten to the six and ten to the eight. But I think the data that you showed from the si um, cell systems data set, um, where you have the forty markers or something that I mean, you can plot the distribution of each of these markers and then resample and ask. Mm -hmm. Is this enough data to fulfill the central limit theorem? If you do, then you can probably model some of the network with a normal ODE system. And then for the ones yeah. that are very stochastic, you maybe have to use a hybrid approach. And maybe that's a way yeah. that is actually feasible to start approaching that. Yeah, that's a very good point. So I would guess that if you're considering, a, say, a, a transcriptional regulation system, especially in yeast, there are so few mRNA molecules that the noise is going to be really pervasive and difficult to characterize and, and to make predictions. We consider cell cycle regulation in yeast where there's a lot of noise at the mRNA level, but it gets washed out a bit at the protein level where the real dynamics is occurring. And we found, as you suggested, that the best way to do stochastic simulations of yeast cell cycle is to do a hybrid approach where the messenger RNA molecules are modeled by a Gillespie type of a scheme to characterize the noise at the mRNA level. And then at the protein level, we can use um, ordinary differential equations for the proteins that are at high concentrations, thousands of molecules per cell. And it, it, in that case, it worked very well, and, and we got a very good description of the noisy progression of the cell cycle in budding yeast. Thank you. Okay, John, I also have a question. So you talk about this uh, bifurcation analysis, right? This is a you only have a one parameter, two parameter bifurcation. But this is typically you you focus on a, a small a small network motif. As you mentioned, what you do is you can divide your more complex one into different regions, uh, different parts, but each part can do this kind of analysis. I wonder if there are any alternative. So really, you know, we're talking about <clears throat> a more complex network. You have many um, parts. They may have a lot of uh, 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 this uh, binary, uh, this switch, they combine together. Well, also they, in this case, can, there are any other way we, probably we can do this more system level analysis? <laughs> um, yeah, I, I'm not exactly sure. So again, Bale and I are experts on cell cycle progression. And, and cell cycle progression is governed by a number of different switches. They, they're called cell cycle checkpoints. And, and we tend to concentrate on each checkpoint separately and 
at least at the first stage, to try to understand the switching property at the isolated checkpoints. And then later to put the checkpoints together into a larger model. Uh, that's the approach we've taken. Uh, and I don't know a better way to do it, I guess. Okay. Um, any other question from the audience? Even you want to ask something for a uh, clarification, uh, you can just ask. Uh, hello, uh, I had a quick question. I'm sorry if you can't hear me. Um, on the summary page that you were, or the slide that you showed, you had a line for the periodicity. Can you explain how that was working? In the, um, the oscillations? Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, let me see. Uh, here, you mean this uh, line here? It, yeah, exactly. Because I can understand how you're producing the rest of the graph, but I'm wondering if the period there, are you? do you mean like you took a certain slice of it or is that the largest period? What, what yeah, is so the... Yeah, I went over that fast. The, the way you interpret a diagram like this is, uh, these are the steady state behaviors, stable, steady state, unstable, stable. The green is the locus of the stable limit cycle. So at sigma equal two, there's an oscillation that goes up and down between the maximum and the minimum given by the, the outline, the green dashed line. And the period of that oscillation is what? About seven, eight minutes. So the period is plotted here. And at the hop bifurcation, at the lower hop bifurcation, the period is eight and a half minutes. As the um, injection rate increases, the period basically falls linearly until the oscillations disappear at the upper hop bifurcation with a period of about three and a half minutes. Okay. Got it. And so, this all the software, the software that calculates the or gives you the period as well as the end. Okay, I got it. So that just you so happen to like overlay that uh, yeah. period one onto this graph. It wasn't related to the actual site. No, that's right. Great. Thank you. No problem. Okay.